In this week's video, we'll review the latest charts, data sets, and studies to help us answer the question, what does history say about a Fed pivot in the second half? Since the concept of volatility to ignore relative to volatility to respect is still relevant in a downtrend, it might be helpful to ask an answer. How much progress have stocks made in attempting to form a lasting bottom? This segment of the video is being recorded Friday, July 8th at approximately 10 a.m. Eastern Time after the release of another strong labor report. I have to keep in mind any reaction today, good, bad, or indifferent by the close, 4 p.m. on Friday, July 8th, has to be taken somewhat with a grain of salt since we have a CPI report or fresh inflation data coming next Wednesday morning, July 13th. We'll update these figures as of Friday's session and kick things off with some charts, visuals, and historical comparisons to help us better understand bottoming process odds relative to ongoing bear market odds. From a technical, psychological, and economic perspective, the present day shares a lot with these periods here. In each case, the S&P 500 fell greater than 20% over a two-quarter period, meaning these are not V-bottom scenarios. In most of these cases, it took two quarters to get down this far, and typically when something like that happens, there's some type of basing process, so you don't really get a V, you get more of a U. And as we've covered in the past, following these periods here, looking at one year, Really good things happened. Every single case, the stock market was higher. The average gain was 28%. The median gain, 26.7%. Keeping in mind that this table here encompasses both of these signals, we're going to focus on the second signal in this week's video. And while the returns were very satisfying and the drawdowns, for the most part, somewhat muted, there were a few cases where things were a little bit dicey walking forward. If we put these drawdowns here on a 2022 chart with the exception of this case here, for the most part, it aligns with a troughing or accumulation type strategy if we see what we want to see. So let's take a closer look at these periods because they share a similar time element, a duration, a two quarter period, and a similar magnitude element, a 20% or greater drop over those two quarters. Not the case here, this is just one quarter. And this is relevant from an economic and psychological perspective because the decline took quite a while, six months to evolve. It's quite a bit different than the COVID crash that took about three weeks to evolve. So we'll start with this June 1962 case and then walk through all of the historical cases and compare them to the present day and see what we can learn. So in this case, your two quarter drop ends right here where my cursor is at the end of July, 1962. That's in close proximity to where the bear market began. This is the initial 20% decline here. So this is very, very similar to the present day case. Thus, hypothetically in the present day, we would be in this window here if the present day were similar. And as we've discussed in the past, from a risk reward perspective or margin of safety perspective, if you entered here at this closing low here, especially in this window here, your margin of safety or the probability of good things happening is much higher over here than it is over here on this initial push off the low. You can draw a horizontal line in this region here and hit price going back five months. You can see when this rally fails here, that's quite a bit different than this convergence look that we have here where these moving averages are converging and they're all turning up simultaneously. So this is the type of transition that we're looking for in the present day. We go from essentially a full bore bearish look over here on the left side of the screen to essentially a full bore bullish look on the right side of the screen. Here, the fastest moving average blue is on the bottom teal the slowest moving average is on the top over here and the slopes of all of the moving averages are down for the most part it's the mirror image of that over here blue the fastest moving average is on top teal the slowest moving averages on the bottom and the slopes of the moving averages are all up 
1970 case, the two-quarter decline that's similar to the present day completed at the end of June 1970, which would be in this area here. So this area here would be hypothetically similar to the present day. And this area here is similar to June 13th of 2022, when we had the first closing decline of 20% or greater from the S&P 500's recent closing high that was made on January 3rd of this year. So in this case, we're somewhere between this point and this point here. So what we're trying to do here is discern between failed bear market rally attempts like this rally attempt here and this rally attempt off the low that was successful. And we build a scoring system or a special situation model. We're looking for subtle differences. Here's one subtle difference. Notice the pink 75 day moving average and the green 50 day moving average. In here, price makes a stand for the most part above those moving averages as they're turning up. So compare this look here to this look in here where the rally fails. This rally attempt, you can never clear the orange 125. Here you do. So in every single case, we're looking for that transition from full bore bearish to something that looks closer to full bore bullish. In this case, price went sideways for approximately five months in here. In this case, we can draw a horizontal line in this area here and hit price going back four months. The 1974 case has two periods where you had consecutive quarterly declines that check the boxes, the end of September 1974 and the end of December 1974. So that would be, this point here would be similar to the present day hypothetically, and this point here would be similar to the present day hypothetically. This point up here would be similar to June 13th of this year when we entered the bear market. So once again, we're looking for differentiators between this failed rally attempt here, this failed rally attempt, and ultimately this successful base in here and successful rally attempt. You can almost visualize the shift to a full bore bullish look in here as the moving averages begin to converge and turn up in this area here. So price right here is basically in the identical spot to where it is here, just a few days after the low. But your risk reward profile, if you are patient, in terms of reallocating your capital, at least with some of your capital, is much more advantageous in here. It's not easy to visualize a full bore bullish look during this failed rally attempt here. Not the case here. The further this goes along, the more you can visualize that you can see it's possible that we could be transitioning back towards that full bore bullish look. The dot-com bear market featured two 20% declines. The second 20% decline was hit in here, July 10th of 2002. So you can make an argument that this period here, somewhat similar to June 13th of this year. And the back-to-back -back quarterly declines ended at the end of September of 2002, which would be down in this area here. So this window between this point in here and this point in here, similar to the present day. The S&P 500 makes its final closing low in October, but really doesn't start to take off from a risk reward perspective. And the sweet spot is in here. That's in the spring of 2003. And in this area here, you can draw a horizontal line going backwards and hit price nine months prior. So you basically have a nine month base a nine month period where you're transitioning from a weak trend to an improving trend. Price is basically in the identical spot right here as it is here very early in the bottoming process, but we have that converging turning up look telling us our risk reward here from a probability perspective is more favorable than it is back here. And you can see this rally attempt, the initial rally attempt from October into the end of November, for the most part, was fully retraced all the way back here. This low here is very, very close to this lowest close that occurred in October of 2002. So really what you're doing here, compare this rally attempt here in the orange box to this area in here. 
Similar situation here, 2008-2009 case. Your 20% decline comes in here. Look at the moving average and trend profile on this rally attempt. Compare and contrast it to this here. If you look closely, there's numerous subtle differences between the two boxes. In this case, we have approximately a six month base in this window here. And again, in this area here, you can start to visualize that transition to a full bore bullish look. So how does all of this compare to the present day if we use the exact same moving averages? This is the S&P 500 during the session on July 8th. This is 9.41 a.m. The market was down approximately 12 points, so somewhat flattish. From a price perspective in here, we can really only draw a horizontal line going backwards roughly one to two months. So it is possible that this is the early stages of a basing pattern. From a sentiment perspective and from an oversold perspective, we have a lot of data in hand that would tell us it is possible that this was your final low. And until proven otherwise, we can give the basing pattern the benefit of the doubt as long as it's still in play. This is a relatively short base relative to some of these other bases that we've taken a look at. Let's go back to the 1962 case. Here's your final closing low in here. but We really don't start to take off until several months later. So what we're really asking here, if we just looked at the moving averages, the moving average profile in here, how does the present day compare to this look in here where we're starting to see some of the faster moving averages turn up? This is a look at the same moving averages. If we just look at the moving averages and remove price, this is as of the close on Thursday, July 7th, after a 57 point rally in the S&P 500 index. If we're just looking at the moving averages here. We have a full bore bearish look still. So from a trend perspective, there's a lot of work to do. Blue, the fastest moving averages on the bottom. This is the eight day moving average. The slope of it is down here, slightly down. So we have the fastest moving average on the bottom. The slopes of all of the moving averages are down and teal, the slowest moving averages on the top. So in terms of hard evidence in hand, in terms of checking boxes relative to a transition like this, where do we stand? Well, you can guess with this look here, you really haven't done a whole lot. This is during Friday's session after the open, approximately 9.50 a.m. Less than 1% of the bullish boxes have been checked. It's important to keep in mind, we could have said something similar in this area here and the final low was already in. And that may be the case in the present day. But remember, we've said before, the final low being in and the market being ready to rally are really two different things. So in the short run, it's not really about do we think the market's going to go up because here the market went up quite a bit and then it gave almost all of it back within the context of a weak trend. The fact that we have a full bore bearish look as of Thursday's close, that tells us we probably do have room to rally into this area here. But history says most likely that would be part of a basing process that could take some time. No predictions in any shape, form, or fashion. Think of it this way. If we're going to have new uptrends, this is the type of look we need to morph into. This is the type of look we need to morph into. This is the type of look we need to morph into. We need to morph into something more like this or more like this which means we still, at least from a historical perspective, most likely have some work to do. And even under a best case scenario, that most likely would take some additional time. You have to be very, very careful too within the context of a weak trend that we don't get whipsawed out of our minds. Now, from a shorter term perspective, it's important to keep in mind the market to fill this gap here could rally an additional 100 points from where we are relative to 11.35 a.m. Eastern Time on Friday, July 8th. So we've got this big gap up here. This low is 4017, 40.17 on the S&P 500. So this gap is up here. It's possible we could go up 100 points and fill it. 
But that rally or hypothetical gap fill, because that may or may not happen in the short run, would be occurring within the context of a weak trend. Last thing the S&P 500 did from a price perspective is make a new lower low. We don't have any important higher high here, even on the shortest term time frame. We'd have to exceed this high up here to really check any box that would be relevant. We did that up here and that didn't work out really well either. So this is our look in the present day. Here's a period in history that's similar to the present day. And here's a period in history that's similar to the present day. The bottom was in in this case, but this first big move was almost fully retraced. Now let's shift gears to inflation, history, and the Fed to see what we can learn. So the weak trends and the gap 100 points above have to keep in mind that all of that, filling that gap, could occur when we still have an incredibly important inflation report coming in just a few trading days. Ultimately, stock market bulls want two things to happen. They want inflation to calm down and they want the Fed to back off. The early read after Friday's labor report was to say, for the most part, 100% odds that we're going to get a 75 basis point hike at the next meeting, July 27th. In fact, there was a small probability, about 2 to 3%, that they could raise by 100 basis points. So that would tell us that interest rate expectations, at least the knee-jerk reaction early on Friday morning, was for higher rates, not lower rates. And historical context is extremely important here. This is back on May 10th. Fed's Waller promises to tackle inflation, says mistakes of the 1970s won't be repeated. A direct quote from Waller down here. We know what happened for the Fed not taking the job seriously on inflation in the 1970s, and we ain't gonna let it happen again. What's he talking about? On the right side of the screen here, this is the annual inflation rate year over year, and this is the federal funds rate. This is the rate that the Fed moves to adjust interest rates. You can see from 1968 to 1969, inflation picked up quite a bit and the Fed raised interest rates significantly. But then they backed off. They dropped rates significantly and inflation returned. And it was much, much worse. 6.2% in 1969. 1973, after they lowered rates. So they raised rates, dropped them prematurely. Inflation went up to 8.7% and then 12.3%. Once again, when inflation started to drop in 1975, they lowered rates again. Inflation returned 9% in 1978. A new high water mark in 79, 13.3%, 12.5%, and then 8.9%. And eventually, interest rates had to hike the federal funds rate all the way up to 18% to tame inflation because they didn't take care of it back here almost 10 years earlier. This is a 10 year period from right here to here. This is what Waller was talking about back in May of this year. This is Waller again this week. That's the whole thing we know about expectations. Once they become unanchored, you've lost. I never wanna to get to the point where these things keep creeping up. We've got to chop this off now. So take this quote here and take this concept here about not repeating the same mistakes and look at it in this context here where they didn't chop it off. The moral of the story is it's highly unlikely that the Fed is going to become dovish early here. Powell has already stated earlier in the year that they're not looking at nuances in the inflation reports to see if inflation is coming down. It's really not even enough for inflation to come down a little bit. It's got to come down significantly. Waller again earlier this week. Readings on monthly core inflation need to reach levels consistent with 2.5% or 3% annualized rates by the beginning of next year to really think about backing off on the interest rate hikes. Right now, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Inflation doesn't need to slow down or calm down a little bit. It needs to come down. We are significantly above these levels in the present day, whether you use the Fed's favored reading on inflation or you use CPI. The last reading on CPI was in the eights. And to date, we've really not heard anything from Powell that sounds even remotely like a pivot. 
This is back in May of this year. Achieving price stability, restoring price stability is an unconditional need. It's something we have to do because really the economy doesn't work for workers or for businesses or for anybody without price stability. So it's the bedrock of the economy really. And that's something we need to do. And that means get inflation down. This statement is made in this historical context where inflation ended up being a problem for over a decade. Now we know we have a CPI report coming out next Wednesday. What are the odds that it's going to significantly improve? Well, that's very difficult to determine until we see the report. However, housing or shelter is about 33% of CPI. Bloomberg, July 5th, the principal culprit is housing, the main expenditure for a majority of American households. Despite the rise in mortgage rates, house prices remain elevated. Increasingly, first-time home buyers are getting priced out of the market, and that will put upward pressure on rents. So home prices really haven't pulled back at all. And since it's harder to get a mortgage, that puts more pressure or demand on rents, and it's possible that rents will increase. Of course, all of this is hypothetical. How about around the globe? Recent readings on inflation, have they come down? The answer is no. July 4th, inflation expectations hit record in Bank of Canada surveys. July 4th, South Korea's inflation hits fastest pace since 1998. July 6th, Taiwan inflation hits 14-year high. July 7th, Peru to hike rates as inflation hits 25-year high. We know that a lot of the factors impacting inflation are global in nature. Supply chain issues, high oil prices, and almost every single major country around the globe printed a lot of money and sent out a lot of checks on the back end following COVID. So recent reads on inflation, not really encouraging. The market knows a report's coming next week. Right now, the trends are weak. This from Bloomberg on July 6th. A broad index of inflation expectations that Federal Reserve Chair Powell flagged recently is expected to show a big rise when it's published later this month. Nobody knows. Nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody knows what that CPI number is going to look like next week. But we really don't have a lot of evidence in hand telling us that inflation has slowed down or pulled back in any significant way relative to these Fed targets, 2.5% or 3.5%. And it's also possible that extremely weak consumer sentiment will eventually bleed over into the economy. And while the VIX has remained fairly tame, positioning in the options market is putting up some yellow flags here. Volatility traders are putting their guard up just as U.S. stocks bounce back with options signaling the highest level of anxiety since right before the 2020 pandemic crash, which is a 30% plus drawdown in the S&P 500. This is short-term volatility expectations, the standard VIX relative to longer-term three-month volatility expectations. You can see you get a spike before it's over in 2008, 2009. You get a spike before the low in 2010 spike before the low in 2011, a spike before the low in 2016, get two spikes before lows in 2018, and a spike here before the COVID low. Haven't had that type of spike yet in the present day. Credit markets from our friend Dean Christians over at Sentiment Trader. The 10 to three month treasury yield curve spread is contracted by a significant amount typically signals a potential softening in economic activity. So over here, he's looking at subsequent S&P 500 performance when you get something similar that's occurred within the context of an equity bear market, as we are today. Shorter term performance for the market, one week, two weeks, one month, two months, not particularly attractive. Basically flat, the median outcome flat, negative one month and negative two months out. It does improve looking out longer term, just as we would expect based on everything that we know today. Six months out, 50% of the cases, the market was green. 50% of the cases, the market was red. The median gain, basically flat. 
And that would align with the possibility of the market needing to form some type of base in subsequent months. All hypothetical. We did have a strong breath day on Thursday of this week, but from Lowry's here, you really need to see that type of breath action occur in close proximity to a 90% down day. Another thing that we'd like to see in terms of a bottoming process, credit spreads here, Monday, March 23rd. It's the day of the low in the S&P 500 index after the COVID crash, and you can see credit spreads drop rapidly. We have had them pull back a little bit in the present day in the month of July, but nothing significant yet. For the most part, these weekly videos cover the topic of how we're going to allocate capital at the margin, which means this week's video is about allocating additional capital. And if we're trying to decide whether we should put more capital in harm's way, it might be helpful to ask and answer these three questions. Do we have data in hand making a strong case that inflation is under control? Has the Fed pivoted in a meaningful manner? Have stock market trends improved in a material manner? Next Wednesday's CPI or inflation report will go a long way in answering question number one. But given what we know today, the most prudent answer seems to be not yet. Relative to question number two, this week's quote from Fed Governor Christopher Waller may sum that up. This week he said, we've got to chop this off now when referring to high inflation. And if we really want to get a handle on Fed policy, really the best way to do that is to listen to what the chairman is saying. And if we examine question number three, as of the close on Friday, July 8th, it's very, very difficult to answer that question in any other way other than not yet. If we compare this rally here to this counter trend rally here, to the current counter trend rally in its present form. You can make an argument, this is the weakest of the three. Look at the slope of the 21 day moving average in red up here. Look at the slope of the 21 day here and look at the slope during the current rally attempt. Same thing with the eight day in blue. Look at the duration of the positive slope in here. How long is the slope positive? Shorter here and thus far even shorter still. It's within the realm of possibility that the low is in place, and it's within the realm of possibility that we're in the early stages of some type of basing formation or consolidation pattern. But until proven otherwise, we remain in a downtrend. How about the tame VIX? Well, all things being equal, if you're a bull, you'd prefer the VIX to be tame, however, the VIX is down near levels currently. Here's where we are on Friday, during Friday's session. Here's the close in early to mid-June. You can make an argument this is a complacent look. You can make an argument this is a complacent look, possibly. And right after this look here, which is similar to the present day look, the S&P 500 dropped 12%. As always, all of the commentary from this week's video is based on the facts, data, and charts that we have in hand today. Thus, we all know the only way any of this works is if we head into next week and every week with that flexible, unbiased, and open mind. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or an offer to buy or sell any securities or any related financial instruments, nor should any of its content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice, and Shivako Capital Management LLC or CCM is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates or clients may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.